Caroline's going to speak to us for a bit, and then she's going to take questions from the floor, which is brave or stupid, I'm not sure. Um, but be thinking about what those questions might be. But uh, Caroline, we're incredibly grateful for your hard work, and that we are glad that you are our local MP, and uh, we're grateful that you're here this morning. Let's give a round of applause for Caroline. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for such a, a kind introduction. Um, so, my starting point uh, this morning is that I think if we're going to mobilize enough political pressure to have the chance of a good outcome from these UN climate talks, then in a sense we need to get an awful lot better at imagining the better world that we can create if that does happen. And I often reflect that so much of the discourse about addressing the climate crisis is framed in terms of sacrifices, of giving things up and what we can't do. And unsurprisingly, that's not a very attractive proposition for a lot of people. But increasingly, I think there is a recognition that tackling the climate emergency also gives us the chance of combining both social justice and environmental justice. In other words, it does give us our best chance of creating a world that's not only greener, but a world that is fairer as well. And it's summed up in one of my favorite cartoons, which shows a professor in front of a whiteboard in their lecture theater. And on the whiteboard behind them, they've put all of the advantages of moving to a zero carbon future. So it's got things like, you know, better, more affordable public transport, or kids playing safely in the streets again, or more nutritious local food, or or proper insulation in people's homes so people aren't dying of fuel poverty in the 21st century. And then there's a speech bubble coming out from one of their students. And in the speech bubble, it says, but what if climate change is a hoax and we've created a better world for no reason? And I think that <laughs> that opportunity to create that better world is something that we absolutely need to put much higher up our organizing principles, if you like, and, and, and to really try to mobilize around that. But to create that better world, I think in a sense we have to get better at imagining it as well. And so I wanted to start, if it's okay, by reading a letter that I wrote for a collection called Letters to the Earth. You might have seen it. It's, it's this rather beautiful looking book. It was um, edited by, uh, by Emma Thompson, the actor, and it's published by Writers Rebel. And it's basically a whole range of different people's letters to the earth. And my letter is called A Failure of Imagination. And it goes, Dear artists and writers and poets and musicians, I'm writing to ask if you will help us. Will you help us protect this precious earth to inspire us to believe that it's not too late to act, to show us that each and every one of us can make a difference and to convince us that the system can still be changed? I ask this of you because I recognize that politics has failed. And as a politician myself, that's not an easy thing to admit. But I know that even those politicians who understand the urgency of making the transition to a zero carbon economy have not succeeded in persuading parliaments around the world to act with the speed and determination that's necessary. In our obsession with policies and procedures and parts per million, we've appealed to the heads, but have failed to touch the hearts of the people we represent. And yet the overwhelming question we face today is one that needs not only an intellectual response, but an emotional one as well. Why didn't we save ourselves when we had the chance? Those words quite literally haunt me. I wake up in the middle of the night with them going on over and over in my head. Ten simple words that are spoken by the late, great Pete Pothelswaite in the wonderful film, The Age of Stupid. He plays one of the few survivors of climate catastrophe in 2055. And as he looks back, at reels of television footage, real footage from the terrible weather events from the past few years, the typhoons in the Philippines, the heat waves in Australia, the freezing temperatures in the US, he poses this simple question, why didn't we save ourselves when we had the chance? And the hairs go up on the back of my neck. It is the most important question of our time. Why is it that we seem to be content to be the species that spent all its time monitoring its own extinction and its willful and knowing destruction of its own fragile and precious home, rather than taking active steps to avoid it. Now, many reasons have been suggested. The power and vested interests of the fossil fuel companies, for example, who are 
increasingly not simply lobbying government, but being given senior roles within it. Or that people are just too busy trying to get by, trying to cope with putting food on the table. Or that we're being bombarded by thousands of advertisements each day, all of us persuading us, all of them persuading us to go out and consume more, to spend money we don't have, to buy things we don't need, to make impressions that don't last. But more than any of these, I think, what stops us from acting is the fact that we rarely have the courage to emotionally connect with the reality of what we're doing to our beautiful and precious Earth. Academically, theoretically, we know about the dangers of exceeding 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming. But one of the reasons we don't internalize that reality is perhaps the fear of the darkness that might engulf us if we do. How do we cope with the thought that humanity might not wake up in time, that climate change might become irreversible, that societies, even in the developed world, might no longer have the ability to respond or to cope? How do young people, in particular, cope with the reality that their parents' generation has brought this earth close to collapse? When we really connect and feel the reality of what we're doing, such feelings of powerlessness and of despair can be difficult to escape. And that's why we need your help. We need you to paint the positive pictures of how the world could be, and to tell us the vivid and compelling stories that show us that when people come together and act, there is always hope. We need you to remind us that human beings are endlessly caring and creative and innovative, and that if we choose to, we can set our minds to anything. We despair when we have no stories to describe the present and to shape the future. And political failure is at root a failure of imagination. But with your help, we can rekindle our imagination and rediscover our power to act. So that's just a bit. That's just a bit about the importance of using our imaginations to really try to mobilize more energy behind the job of, of changing the world. And my starting point really is to go back to that question that Pete Postlethwaite poses in The Age of Stupid. Why is it, knowing what we knew then, we didn't act when there was still time? And I do think it's partly that we can't bear to imagine really what climate catastrophe looks like, that terrifying reality. But I think it's also because, in some senses, we can't quite imagine what the alternative to that is. You know, there's a famous saying, why is it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? And with all the warning lights on the dashboard flashing red, why are we still hurtling towards environmental breakdown? And I would argue that one of the main reasons is because we've got a dangerous and outdated economic system, one that is designed for growth and profit based on the exploitation of people and nature alike. And that the climate and nature crises are not an accident of business as usual. They are an intrinsic feature of the way we've designed our economies. Because our current econo economic model legitimizes greed, it promotes overconsumption, it lords limitless growth. It's one which protects business as usual and immediate gratification over and above a safe planet where all life can thrive. Now, this idea of systems change is one that is gathering pace. Systems change, not climate change, has long been a slogan put on the banners and the placards at climate protests. And I'm sure we'll see it next Saturday, too, as citizens take to the streets to demand radical action from global leaders gathering in Glasgow. And they're right because climate action cannot be radical enough unless it includes economic systems change too. And that means making well-being rather than just economic growth the fundamental goal of our economies. And it means making climate justice our central objective. And so I'm just going to very briefly set out the context for the talks in Glasgow and then touch on three ways that that climate justice needs to be centered in our approach. You'll know, I'm sure, that the 2015 Paris Agreement committed countries to holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. And the difference that just half a degree of warming can make is massive. It's the difference between life and death for millions of people. 
Staying below 1.5 degrees is essential for all of us. And yet the most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warns that unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, then limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees will be beyond reach. Right now there's been a process where different countries have been putting forward their best efforts in terms of saying how much they're going to reduce their emissions by in this next period up to 2030. And even if they all did what they said they were going to do, it would still set us on course for a temperature rise of 2.7 degrees. So not 1.5 degrees, but 2.7 degrees. And that's if they do what they say. So that is the context in which the UK is hosting these talks in Glasgow. This is why the coming decade has been called the most consequential decade in human history. And it's also why, as the host of this big climate meeting, and as the nation that led the industrial revolution that was fueled by coal and colonialism, that's what makes the UK have this particular responsibility to lead the transition to a sustainable, just and resilient world in line with the science <clears throat> and in line with climate justice. So let me just touch briefly on three ways that justice absolutely needs to be central to the government's approach. <clears throat> and the first thing I wanted to talk about responsibility because you'll hear some people say, you know, there's no point in the UK making radical changes because we only account for around 1% 1, 1 of global emissions anyway, so what difference would that make? So the argument goes, you know, when, when countries like China aren't acting fast enough, why should we do anything? And apart from the moral reason, I just want to set out a couple of practical reasons. And the first one is to recognize that one of the reasons that China's got high emissions is that so many other countries have outsourced and offshored their manufacturing to China. You know, we hardly do any manufacturing in the UK anymore. M much of the stuff that we consume is actually produced in countries like China. But when that happens, the emissions that are associated with those imports are put on China's balance sheet, not on ours. So every time the UK reports on its emissions, we only ever look at our production emissions in this country. We take no notice of all of the emissions that have been made in service of the products that we have then chosen to import. And so there's a big campaign that's being run saying, hang on a minute, we should be measuring our success, including our responsibility for consumption emissions, not just production emissions. We need to take account of those imported emissions that are embodied in the produ products that we're using here. And second, what matters for climate change is the cumulative amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere that's been pumped up there ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And although the UK may only be responsible for around 1% of production emissions, if you look at our responsibility for historic emissions, then it's a very different picture. Research has shown that between 1850 and 2007, the UK was responsible for more CO2, carbon dioxide, per person than any other major country. Not surprisingly, because we started the Industrial Revolution. And if you bring that up to date to where we are now, each of us in the UK is essentially sitting on around 1,200 tons of historic CO2. That makes us one of the most historically polluting countries per person in the world. So we're jostling for top spot on historic responsibility just behind the US, but compare that with 150 tons per person for China and 40 tons per person for India, and we've got 1,200 tons. So the first thing when we're talking about justice is recognizing our historic responsibility for the climate change that is already happening. And secondly, I want to say a few words about financial justice, because you'll know that it is the biggest economies in the world that are causing the problem, but it is the smallest and poorest that suffer the biggest consequences. The G20 countries are responsible for 80% of global emissions. And that's why justice demands that we step up and ensure not only do we do much more to get our emissions down, but that we deliver on the financial promises that have been made. And I expect you've heard people talk about the fact that right back in 2009, Richer countries promised to provide $100 billion a year to the global south by 2020. And shamefully, that figure still hasn't been reached. And I have to say that the UK has compromised any kind of influence it might have had in terms of persuading other countries to step up when we are the only G7 country to have cut our overseas aid in the midst of a pandemic. <clears throat> 
And that, in my view, unforgivable decision means that climate programs are being slashed, including some of the world's most climate vulnerable countries in places like Bangladesh. The UK is actually cutting our programs in countries like that. So it's not too late to change direction, but we absolutely do need to step up and make sure that we're making a fair contribution to the finance. And also there's something called loss and damage that I want to say a few words about as well. Because for many climate vulnerable countries, it's too late to try to adapt to the climate change that is already happening. Already, they are losing sometimes 200% of GDP because of cyclones and hurricanes from which they have no real hope of having the finance to recover. And so they've put something on the agenda called loss and damage. And what they're asking the richer countries to do, basically, is to step up with a different pot of money, which we might get, for example, from a levy on the fossil fuel companies, or we could stop giving big subsidies to the fossil fuel companies. That would be another way of raising the money. And recognizing that for many, many of those poorest countries, they need that money and help now. I wanted to quote from a young Ugandan climate activist, Vanessa Nakati, who has said, our leaders are lost and our planet is damaged. You cannot adapt to lost cultures. You cannot adapt to lost traditions. You cannot adapt to lost history. You cannot adapt to starvation and you cannot adapt to extinction. And that's why this new item on the agenda, loss and damage, is just so important. And finally, I just wanted to say a word again about the context for these negotiations because as you won't need reminding, these talks are happening when the pandemic, the COVID pandemic continues to rage in many of the poorest countries. And I just do think that if we're hoping that poorer countries will do some kind of deal with us in Glasgow, then we need to take account of the fact that only 2% of the populations of low income countries have received even one dose of the COVID vaccine. Of the 540 million doses promised by the richer nations, just 16% have so far reached their destination. And I think that failure is a, a moral obscenity. And I think that it's also entirely counter to our own self-interest. So if COP26 is to succeed, I think the justified anger of the countries in the global south urgently needs to be addressed as well. So Glasgow is our chance to, to really step up on climate justice. It's our chance to make good on the pledges and promises we've made to some of the poorest countries in the world. It's also our chance, as I said right at the very beginning, to create that better world, to make sure it is a greener and fairer world. Because I think if we don't, then future generations will look back at this moment and wonder what, what on earth were we thinking. Thank you, Caroline. Um, we're going to take some questions. And just to help you to uh, verbalize those questions, why don't you just take 30 seconds to talk to somebody next to you? What, what questions arise out of that? In that spirit of uh, no stupid questions, well, there are stupid questions. It's a funny phrase, isn't it? But uh, what are your questions that you'd want to ask Caroline about? It might be that you want to think about how do we root this for us? Um, it might be that you want to ask some questions about some of the bigger policy stuff that Caroline's just shared. But just take 35 seconds to talk to someone around you. What are the questions that you might want to ask? Go for it. 
Okay, let me, um, let me interrupt you. So the way I'm going to do this, um, because I haven't thought through the logistics of microphones, is I'm going if to, you, if you put your hand up, I'll hear your question and then I'll repeat it so that the whole room hears it and people on YouTube and Caroline hears it too. But any questions, be brave. Yes, Ali. So the question was about climate refugees, that as the climate changes and uh, people are moved on because of uh, these kind of issues and countries like ours taking less refugees, uh, what's the impact of that and will that be discussed this in these weeks? I think that was the question. So it's, as far as I'm aware, it's not on the formal agenda, um, which is basically made up of, of looking at what's called these NDCs, these nationally determined contributions. This is when the countries put forward their, um, their proposals for how much they're going to cut their emissions by, and then there'll be lots of discussion about the finance. Um, so I don't think there'll be um, a, a dedicated slot on the, on the agenda specifically necessarily around refugees, but certainly in all of the uh, discussions around it, because you know there are so many non-government organizations and citizens' movements being there, and certainly for them, I think it will be an issue that's right at the heart of the agenda, because in a way it does go to that whole climate justice debate, really, doesn't it, as you're, as you're saying, that... Um, the idea that we would be, first of all, in the richer countries, making countries in the south unlivable because of our production and consumption patterns, and then preventing them from being able to escape from that is just, seems to me, to be sort of leveling that injustice several times over. So I, I think there will be discussion, and I think if, if some of the governments were to listen to that, it might just concentrate their minds a little bit more, and might mobilize them to, to act more, because when you see how the Home Office gets very exercised about really relatively small numbers of people you know, taking to the boats and arriving in Dover, if you can imagine, if, if, if we get to the worst of climate change, then the numbers of people on the move then will just be huge. It will be terrible, a really, really mass, mass amount of, of suffering. So I hope very much that we can raise that issue and, and get it onto the main agenda. Who else? Yes. There were two hands here, but go, go on. We'll go first and then. Um, hi. So I want to ask what you think the best way is of addressing problems with the media and their coverage of climate issues, because I think gaining uh, public uh, acceptance and understanding is so important, and yet the media is so fragmented, and so many people who actually need to see, to reach with the message don't get reached because they're not engaging with media that are telling them about it. And I think you've got media who are being really responsible, but of course, challenging the media is quite a sensitive thing, especially about the issues that happen uh, to the children of Benin or the Rock Crescent. I didn't seem to work very well. I was wondering if you had any other thoughts on that. It's a good question, Pete, but I have to repeat it all now. This is a stupid idea. <laughs> how do we deal with, how do we challenge the media to uh, tell us truth, and how do you engage with it uh, for those people who want to understand and know more. Is that a fair summary? Well, I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> the media has, has moved on this, thank goodness. It wasn't very long ago that the BBC was m making it such that whenever they had someone on their programme talking about the, the dangers of, of, of climate change, they would have someone on the other side for balance saying it wasn't happening, which is quite an extraordinary uh, state of affairs. And thankfully, they've, they've moved away from that. I think the real challenge with the media now is about consistency, really. So right now, you know, if you turn on your TV or you, you, you look at the papers and so forth, climate change is very much on the front pages because the summit is happening in Glasgow. But as soon as that, you know, that summit is finished, they all move on, the agenda moves on, and it's forgotten again until the next year. Um, and that is the real challenge, I think, is to try to get the media to look at every subject through the lens of climate, because it is the existential threat that we face, and none of the other issues that we're dealing with will get resolved if we have a planet that is spiraling out of control when it comes to climate change. So, you know, when it came to the budget just a few days ago, yeah, a few media outlets looked at the fact that, in fact, 
Rishi Sunak didn't even mention the word climate change in his budget statement, and he also put in place a number of policies that will make climate change worse, like cutting the cost of domestic flights. Um, but there wasn't much about that, because the budget is about the economy, and the economy isn't about climate change, so they would think. Whereas, in fact, of course, absolutely, the economy is about climate change. And if you've got an economy that is based on more and more extractive and exploitative growth, then you are going to have more emissions that go alongside it. So it is about trying to challenge them to be more consistent. I think, you know, social media has, has a big role to play, but as we all know, there are dangers with that as well as, as benefits because you don't necessarily know the source of what you're looking at, and you might be looking at some really great material and information, but you might also be looking at a whole load of misinformation without necessarily knowing that. So although social media can definitely step up in there, and I would really urge people to look at wonderful sites like Open Democracy, who've got a wonderful um, series on, on climate change at the moment, which does kind of fill in the gaps. But that's only for people who are already motivated to start looking at that. And, and for people who aren't, for people who, for whom this is not yet necessarily on their radars in any big way, then I think you know, that the challenge is to say to the media that, that A, they should be covering this, but, but B, trying to point out, as, as, as I tried to do a little bit today, which is to say, how do we make climate change real to people and how do we demonstrate that it isn't all about shivering around a candle in a cave? You know, it's, if we had a proper home insulation scheme that was run by local authorities street by street, you know, this would get people's fuel bills down, it would end fuel poverty, it would get climate emissions down, it would create millions of jobs all around the, the country. You know, there's a, there are real positives of this, of this agenda which all too often get overlooked. And I think if we could have some of that positive messaging, that might also mean that, that more people would engage with the issues. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. You've given a very good speech about um, climate change. But my question to you is, um, how do we reduce, um, or what, is, what, what are we doing here to actually support you know, those in countries that actually produce things that we actually use here, like, are we going to make them poorer nations, whereas boosting the climate here and, you know, causing damages to them over there? Thank you. Should I just let you, yeah. Um, so I think the question is about how do we make sure that we don't make poorer countries even poorer by somehow saying that we don't want the products from there. Is that kind of what you were suggesting? Um, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that we absolutely need to address because quite a lot of climate change is caused by bringing in products from the other side of the world rather than having more local trade routes. And so part of it, I think, comes back to challenging what's been a bit of a uh, kind of a an ideology from the richer governments, which, which has been that they've always been saying trade, not aid. I, I'm not suggesting that we need, you know, that aid is better than trade, but I do think that climate reparations, making sure that money goes from north to south is hugely important. And we shouldn't just think that trade is going to be the only way we do that, because otherwise you are locked into saying we need more and more international trade with countries on the other side of the world. And I'm not convinced that's best for those countries either because the revenues don't necessarily actually filter down to some of the poorest people who aren't the ones who are exporting. Um, and it's certainly not good, good from, a, from a climate perspective. So I think there's a, a real debate about how we make sure that, that support for the global south and justice for the global south is something that is sometimes linked to trade but not exclusively linked to trade. We need fair trade. And, and, and the terms of trade need to make sure that the, that the finance is going to some of the poorest people. But we shouldn't think that's the only way that we make financial flows from the north to the south. That needs to be separate from trade as well. Otherwise, we will be locked into, into some of these processes. So I think that, that you've put your finger on, on, on a really important issue. Um, and it's one that needs to be part of our discussions because otherwise, as I say, we'll end up with a, with a kind of trade, not aid, lens, which means that everything is being premised on more and more trade, which doesn't, I think, help some of the poorest people in those countries, but also has those big climate emissions associated with it too. Let's go over this side. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe that um, uh, one of the leading politicians was a bit skeptical about the need to recycle. 
um, and was wondering if I should be giving that advice to my 12-year-old son that he shouldn't bother recycling for the future. So something that, uh, that Boris Johnson said, wasn't it? Um, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, which I don't often do, but I think, I think what he was trying to get at was that recycling isn't enough rather than you shouldn't recycle. So um, I think recycling absolutely has its place. Of course it does. But to the extent that when you talk about a kind of a waste hierarchy, there are things that are even more important than recycling, like reusing, if you possibly can in the first instance, then, then there was a kernel of truth in what he was saying. So I would absolutely say, please don't tell people not to recycle. But if there are ways of designing our economy better so that rather than having to wait to the end of the life of something and then recycle it, if we could have more of an economy based on repair, for example, and reducing use, then even better. And I'm always surprised that there's not more of a kind of a public cry for for the right to repair. You know, how annoying is it so many times that you've got some kind of appliance, like, I don't know, a toaster or something, and it's stopped working, and probably, if you could just get the bit that's, you know, the new filament or whatever it might be, you could make that go on. Instead of that, we've got built-in obsolescence because that suits the producers more because you, you throw it out and buy another one, which is, which is silly. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, keep, keep recycling, but also see if there are more things that can be done in terms of, of repairing and, and reusing and indeed reducing the amount that we're using in the first place when that's relevant. Um, yeah, I really like what you said um, about um, kind of building a positive imagination and your letters were like addressed to writers and musicians and artists. And I was just wondering if you had like policy ideas about kind of fueling that positive imagination just you know in the lockdown many people all you could do is go for walks in nature and suddenly people rediscovered that connection with nature and actually thought gosh you know that slowing down of life automatically means we consume less and I just wondered if you had policy ideas with um, the arts and creative industries of yeah uh, fueling a new imagination how we can yeah, that change the hearts first, perhaps, so they actually were really excited about wanting to save this thing. And if there were practical ways you can do that. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of a, of a policy for the arts, I guess I would just make my starting point, the idea that the arts are absolutely fundamental to our lives. They're not a nice to have, you know, if, if we can afford it after we've done the basics. To, to me, the arts are are fundamental in terms of what makes us human and how we express ourselves and how we communicate with one another and, and how we kind of make sense of our, of our lives here. And, and so partly that would be about making sure that arts policy is much more central um, to, to overall policy making and, and not cutting the arts, which is always a budget that often gets cut very early on, um, and recognizing that the arts have a, have a huge role to play in, in lots of these wider sort of small p political movements. And the, right, the Letters to the Earth that I was just reading from was put together by Writers Rebel, which you probably know, but they're a wonderful sort of collective of people coming together to sort of see what role the arts can play in terms of, of reaching people that aren't going to be, you know, watching Newsnight or, 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 or reading the, the newspapers necessarily, but can be touched in different ways. And it just feels to me that that there are just so many different ways that we can try and reach people. One of the most exciting things I've done recently, I was asked to, um, to uh, curate an exhibition at the Towner Gallery in, in Eastbourne, which was just like an amazing opportunity. And so I was able to go through all of their um, collection and put together um, whatever I wanted with whatever theme I wanted. And so, somewhat predictably, I was, I was looking at, um, at environment, and, but, but just choosing some of the most beautiful places near and, and, uh, near and around. And, and then trying to make it a bit interactive so people were invited to kind of respond to some of the landscapes, you know, the, the Revilluses and the, all, all the rest of them. Um, and, and I do think that let's just, be, let's just be a bit more imaginative in terms of how we reach out to people and, and, and use all of the amazing, the amazing uh, channels that we, that we have. Brilliant. We'll have one last question. And then, Michael, can you go and get the kids are going to come back in and... This could go horribly wrong, but they might have some questions. <laughs> could be brilliant. Um, Ruben. Um, every day we hear about uh, young people, like in the news and stuff, um, acting towards the climate crisis, and then, and then we hear about them making changes, but 
they're never really totally acknowledged. They're never kind of respected as an adult and they don't really have the same opportunity to make change. And um, how could we um, improve that kind of um, uh, ability because it's actually their generation that it's going to affect? Wow. An absolutely fantastic question. Thank you for that. And you're so right. Um, and in terms of, of practical things, um, one thing I did in 2019, so a couple of years ago, when Greta Thunberg was in the UK, I think, for the first time, was to arrange for her to meet with party leaders, but not just her, but other UK climate um, uh, activists, but, but young people, you know, people aged 14, 15, whatever. Um, and they did all sit down with, um, sadly, the Prime Minister didn't come, but uh, the party leaders from the other parties did. Um, and there was a real sort of um, reckoning, you, you know, and, and some of the politicians did say that there is something incredibly powerful about young people really challenging you and saying, hang on a minute, that's our future that you're trashing. And when they have to look into the eyes of young people and, and justify inaction, it's actually incredibly powerful. So I think doing whatever we can to maximize the, the opportunities for young people to speak directly to politicians and you know for people um, for whom I'm not their MP but if, if there are other MP people from, from further afield you know do, do go along and, 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 and young people go along to, to MPs please and, and make the case that you've just made because you've put it more articulately and more eloquently than, than, than you know lots of people often do so, so you are incredibly powerful and I think it's important to remember that so I would just like to see as many times as possible for young people to have that direct opportunity to speak the truth to power because it's one of the most powerful things there is. Thanks, Caroline. One of the most annoying things about having Caroline as your local MP is I get bombarded with these things about speak to your local MP about this. And I think, what's the point? She just agrees with me. So, um, so if you could change that, it would be really good. But I, think, I think we do have some questions from the kids who are... Yeah. Anybody want to ask a question? Ethan. Honey, hope you're going to go first. How can us and our schools help save the planet? How can our schools help to um, us and our schools? That is a fantastic um, question. And I think it works on so many different levels. So part of it, for example, might be to ask teachers in your schools if they know, um, for example, whether or not they've made any um, approach to the council to see whether or not there might be the opportunity to put solar panels on the on the roof of the of the school. I know some schools in the city have already got solar panels, which means that instead of using fossil fuels like coal and oil, we're using the power of the sun. Other things are to do with um, which electricity supplier is supplying the school, because again, you can choose greener electricity suppliers. But actually, what lots that you can do is, is, is things sort of around your school itself. So I know lots of schools in the city have got um, green spaces outside where, um, I don't know if it is the case with your school, but where you can learn you know, how to look after um, gardens and how to plant you know, different kinds of vegetables and how to look after earthworms and, and other kinds of animals, and just instilling a love of nature in young people right from the start. And I just think the real challenge is, I know some of our primary schools are actually really fantastic at doing that, but then when we get to secondary school, everything gets terribly serious, and that sense of having space in the natural world is, is squeezed because there's so much else on the curriculum. What I would love to see, and I'm fighting very hard for, is for there to be a new GCSE, a new qualification, um, that would be in natural history so that we could properly give people greater exposure to, to the natural world. There's a lovely saying by a US writer, Richard Louvre, who said, we won't protect what we don't love and we won't love what we don't know. And I think that ability for young people to really know their, their environments, the, the, the green spaces around them, to be able to recognize the birds that they see or the animals that they see and the plants that are growing, I think that just really instills in young people that best opportunity to then become the, the climate and nature activists of, of later on. Ethan. What can children do to help save the environment? What can children do? Well, they can take their parents to task or the people who are, who are um, in their families with them, maybe. And quite a lot of, of adults do say that the reason that they've become much more aware of the nature 
difficulties fa facing our environment or the difficulties facing climate is because young people have spoken to them about it. So never doubt the power of your own voice and just reminding people that when you see the recycling, to go back to the point earlier, going into the wrong bin, to kind of whisk it out again and remind people to do the right thing. And I think as well, I would come back to um, the idea that, that knowing and loving nature is actually really important, spending time in nature, because then I think it is likely to mean that as you get older, then you'll become even more motivated to keep up that, that real concern for it and the concern to protect it. Um, and that's what we need to see. I think we've got a last question. Is that right? How can children best have a voice? Mm, how can children best have a voice? <coughs> that kind of sums up, doesn't it, the kinds of questions that have just been asked over the last 10 or 15 minutes in a way about how we find our voices and, and make them heard. And I would come back to saying that don't underestimate the power of the voice that you have. I mean, some of the questions, all of the questions we've just had from young people are every bit as profound as anything we, you know, that I would say or anyone else would say. And, and I do think there's something incredibly powerful about young people speaking on this issue because <clears throat> as, the, as the young person at the back said, it is your future that's at stake. This is your future. Um, and so finding those opportunities to, to speak out. And that might be about asking you know, s someone in your family if they might take you to meet your local MP or your local councillor. And it feels a lot to kind of put on your shoulders because you've got plenty of other things you need to be doing too. But I do think that saying what you see as the truth and, 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 and really articulating that and getting it heard very directly is one of the best things you can do. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Caroline. Why don't you give her a round of applause? <laughs> Listen to Caroline. I remembered uh, years ago when Caroline came to the church for the first time and she was about to potentially be elected as our MP. And I sort of quite cheekily said, what's the point in voting for you, Caroline? You know, we might like you, but what's the point of one... Green Party member in the House of Parliament. And quick as a flash, she said to me, how many people go to church in Brighton? You know, what's the point? Um, <laughs> and she said this phrase, which I'm sure she said, she said numerous times, is that the truth is the truth even in a minority. And my encouragement to you guys is even if people around you deny it, even if it's not the cool thing to do, even if other people um, want to uh, care for our planet less, the truth is the truth even a minority. Thank you so much for what you shared with us. We're just going to have a very quick couple of things to sort of root uh, in one church life about what we might do together. As Michael comes up and Ali, um, I just want to add one thing as the pastor of this church. It really struck me that Caroline said we need a better imagination about what there could, the world could be like. As Christians, um, that's already there for us. We have a book that begins with a perfected creation that is paradise. And we, in the same book, it finishes with a perfected creation that is redeemed in all its facets. It's where we're heading and we're asked to join in with God's redemptive plan. That's where we, where, where we are. Some terrible theology that we're all floating off to some other place that doesn't exist yet is poor theology. We believe in a new heaven and a new earth where the renewal of all things that the end of the story is a picture of clear running rivers, of perfect oceans, of trees and lives that are flourishing. And that's what we're asked to join in with. So, uh, Michael, let me speak to you first. Um, Michael is a member of the church, but also a member of the YCCN. Tell us what YCCN is. Uh, so YCCN stands for Young Christian Climate Network. Um, we're an action-based group of 18 to 30s that are campaigning for uh, climate justice. And what kind of stuff have you been doing with them? So, it's an emotional weekend. Uh, our relay pilgrimage uh, got to Glasgow yesterday for the start of COP26. Um, it started back in June at the G7 summit. And since then, we've walked the 1,200, 1,500 miles with a flag all the way, kind of calling out Brilliant. our demands along and the way. And you did a section of it in Dartmoor, was it? Yeah, I walked over Dartmoor. So, seven mm. days, I did 100 miles with a flag and met some wonderful people and were put up by some lovely churches uh, along the way. Fantastic. But tell us about, um, about what you might help us do a little bit as a church, Michael. What, uh, what are we trying to sort of galvanise around here? 
Yeah, so there's some really practical stuff that has already been laid out for us. Um, standing on the shoulders of Alex Mabs, who we all love, who's gone up to Yorkshire. Mm. Uh, he's built in a survey called an Eco Church survey. And we're now in a position to get a bronze award from them and the charity A Rocker. It's a Christian charity that helps churches get more kind of sustainable and green. Um, so we'll apply for that. We'll hope to get our bronze award. And then over the next kind of months, years, we'll progress up that. And maybe one day we'll be gold. So we want to be a gold eco church. It's not easy. Look at this building. It's uh, 120 years old. It's, it wasn't designed with really thinking about the climate. Um, so what kind of things will help us? What can we be thinking about? How do we move from bronze to silver to gold? Yeah, so there's some really simple practical ways, like a bike rack is a really practical way. Um, and then think about our buildings. It's a, it's a long, long project, but we can definitely set out a vision and use our imagination to what does a zero carbon one church look like in terms of buildings. But then it's not all about that. It's also about our involvement in the community. So are we hosting green speakers? Are they coming to our church? Um, are we talking about climate change and what we can do personally as well as politically to kind of influence that green change? Are we holding space for that on a regular basis? Um, and yeah, more of that. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. So Michael is, is kind of a rallying point for us, that if you're interested in this stuff and you want to keep the conversation going, this, you know, we've talked about Black Lives Matter, we've talked about women's rights, we've talked about all kinds of stuff during lockdown, and as we've begun to gather back, we are now in a position to say, what are we going to do about this? How are we more disability-friendly as a church? How do, we, how do we better reflect the values of, of God himself? So thank you, Michael. Grab him and ask about ways that you might get more involved. And then a quick... Uh, practical notice about some things that you might want to get involved with from Ali. Hello, everybody. Um, so Ruth, who's over here at the end with the little hat, she came, she's come from uh, Church of the Annunciation in Hanover, and a few years ago we set up Brighton Christian Climate Action, which is a kind of Brighton Christian XR little group. Um, but we're also both part of Brighton Meditators, which is um, an interfaith group of uh, meditators who do non-arrestable action. So we go and meditate in protest. So we've done it at Barclays, who um, contribute a lot to, to fossil fuels. Um, but as COP is just about to start, uh, there are people who have gone up in person, um, but Ruth and Abby from Brighton Meditators um, and I and lots of other people will be attending an online vigil. So it will be, is it 24 hours? No. Okay, 11 till 5. So anyone can attend these online vigils and just a lot of them are just sitting in silence together mm. and praying and meditating and it's a really powerful action that anyone can do. Um, so I've got some leaflets about it. Please come and find me. And also, if anybody wants to join us, there is a, a coalition of green groups uh, marching next Saturday on the Global Day of Action for Climate Justice, starting at 12 o'clock at the level on Saturday. So there'll be lots of people from the Food Partnership, from XR, from the Green Party, I don't know who else, but lots of people Great. all protesting together. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for bringing us this stuff. We're going to finish. We're going to pray and we're going to sing. And we're going to sing because it's this act that we do together. Uh, we're going to sing a song that has a line, we are blessed to bless a world. And I think we live in an incredibly blessed part of the world. And as Caroline pointed out to us, some of our behavior, some of our ability to live, you know, the kind of uh, riches that we do are based on the back of some people who are getting very little. And the whole climate um, poverty argument that we've heard is reflected in, in a song. So um, I think Eden is going to come and read to us uh, a prayer and Kath is as well. But let's, let's uh, if you want to come up here and Kath. And if you're able to, let's stand together as we stand uh, before God to pray these prayers together. Loving God, we, pray, we praise your name with all you have created. You are present in the whole universe and in the, and in the smallest creatures. We acknowledge the responsibilities you have placed upon us 
as the stewards of your creation. May the Holy Spirit inspire all political leaders at, S at COP26 as they seek to embrace the changes needed to foster more sustainable, more sustainable society. Instill in them the courage and gentleness to implement fairer solutions for the poorest and most vulnerable and commit their nations to the care of our common home. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Um, these prayers um, contain a bit of a response, so I'm going to say at the end of um, each line, Lord, in your mercy, and if you want to respond with, hear our prayer. So that's, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the United Nations Climate Conference, COP26, continues in Glasgow, let us bring our prayers to God, who created the earth and all within it. We pray for world leaders that they may all work together through the decisions taken to protect the planet and all who live within it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. May we discern our roles and tasks arising from the decisions taken at COP26 and take action to achieve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world that our collective actions will begin the long process of repair to the damage we have caused, and that God will help us become better stewards. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for one church in our local community, that decisions taken in our church life will help us live simply, sustainably, and in solidarity with the earth and all life within it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, who calls all people to justice and care for the earth, hear and grant these prayers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.